intercultural communication. That's what we're going to be talking about today. Hi, my name is Melissa Siegel. I'm a professor of migration studies, and this is a channel about all things migration. So let's get right into the topic of intercultural communication and why is intercultural communication important? First of all, why is intercultural awareness important? So, you know, on this channel, we're always taking things from research and research suggests that intercultural teams are happier and more productive. So we see within these teams, we see increased creativity and innovation. We see an improved company culture in these kinds of teams. We see greater opportunity for personal growth and professional growth, and we see fewer conflicts where people are more culturally aware. Now, more diverse and inclusive corporations are 35% more likely to outperform their competitors. They are 70% more likely to capture new markets and they are 87% better at making decisions. So these are all good reasons why we should have pretty strong intercultural competencies and make sure that we have intercultural teams. Now, what is intercultural communication? So, you know, we're always defining terms on this channel. So intercultural communication is the ability to engage in successful communication with individuals from different cultures, languages, and social norms. So first of all, language is really important. So understanding different languages, understanding different social conventions, and having more general cultural sensitivity is important. And here we can see that tailoring communication to cultural meanings and audiences, um, frames of reference can be also very important to make sure that we are understood within different cultural contexts. And now it is important that like many things, this is a two-way process. So we need to have mutual understanding that helps to foster interaction and also um, reciprocity to bridging cultural gaps, all right? So it's not just one person's job to do this. Both people or both groups need to do these things to have the best outcomes. So why is intercultural communication important? It's important for understanding and cooperation to avoid conflicts. Of course, business success, personal development, many things we can talk about. Now, what I'm going to talk about today is coming from the book, The Culture Map by Aaron Meyer. And Aaron Meyer is a, an expert in cross-cultural communication and a professor at one of the world's leading business schools. So what they've done in this book then is to look at eight specific scales or eight dimensions in which we can see difficulties in different types of intercultural communication. And I'm going to go into those in just a moment. So of course, the aim of the book <laughs> is to try to avoid misunderstandings and to have better cultural intelligence. Now let's jump into these eight scales or these eight different dimensions that are covered in the book. These are communicating, evaluating, leading, deciding, trusting, disagreeing, scheduling, and persuading. And I will go one by one into each of these and explain differences and nuances here. So of course, let's start with some uh, clarification. So how did the author get to this place um, of sharing these different dimensions and where they also assigned different countries on these continuums? So the process of positioning countries on the scales involved interviewing managers and refining these positions based on feedback from international executives. Each country's position on the scale represents a midpoint of a range of, let's say, culturally accepted behaviors and what's really important here is that relativity is key so the notion of cultural relativity is essential for comprehending the dynamics of cross-cultural interactions so it's really about you know how are people from one context in relation to people from another context so this relativity is really important and you'll see that as we go along so I think an important disclaimer also here to mention is that there is no homogeneous culture 
but the culture context is relevant. So of course, acknowledging individual diversity is vital and avoiding to assume personal traits based on cultural origins when collaborating across cultures is also important. But understanding cultural context really remains crucial despite the complexities that we see arising from individual, organizational, and societal differences. So recognizing how cultural variations influence behaviors, beliefs, and actions can also help to us to unveil more innovative approaches. All right, so let's get started with the first scale or the first dimension, which is on communicating, okay? So how does communication more generally happen? And here you can see it's on a scale from low context to high context. So low context communication here, good communication means then being precise, simple, and clear. Um, messages are expressed and understood at face value and repetition is appreciated if it helps the clarity of communication. All right. So that is people coming from a cultural context where low context communication is important. On the other extreme, we have high context and here good communication is considered sophisticated, nuanced and layered. Um, messages are both spoken and sort of read between the lines. Sometimes we hear the term reading the air. Messages are op often implied, but not plainly expressed. Okay. So these are our two different kind of sides of the spectrum. And here you can see where a number of different countries fall on this continuum. So you can see countries like the US, the Netherlands. So I'm originally from the United States. I live in the Netherlands. So these two countries are much more on the low context side of the spectrum. Whereas countries like Japan, Korea, Indonesia, China, and Kenya are all on the high context side. And you can think for yourself where your own country fits within this spectrum. Do you relate to this? Can you identify with this? Now, when thinking about communicating with people from these different cultures, we can also have some advice. So strategies for working with people from lower context cultures here, be explicit, be clear. Communication should be transparent, specific, and direct. Make sure to provide clear written recaps and summaries to ensure understanding. And open-ended questions can help to clarify any ambiguity. Also, try to avoid forming premature opinions about high context individuals intentions. All right. So that's just some advice when working with people on the lower context side. Now on the higher context side. So here are some strategies for working with people from higher context cultures. So some communication strategies, first of all, um, active listening and seeking implicit cues are important encouraging open dialogue and asking for clarification when needed. Um, Self-deprecating and positive language can also help to bridge communication gaps sometimes. And effective communication with high context cultures involves patience and persistent efforts. All right, so this is just some advice for those of you working in these different cultural contexts. Next, we can look at evaluating, and this is how feedback is given. And here we can see a spectrum again from giving direct negative feedback to more indirect negative feedback and which types of cultures and which countries we see in these different areas. Now, on the direct negative feedback side, we see that feedback is provided frankly, bluntly, and honestly. Negative messages often stand alone and they are not necessarily softened by positive messages. We also see absolute descriptors that are often used like words like totally inappropriate when criticizing something and criticism may be given to an individual also in front of a group. All right. So that's now one side of the spectrum. The other side of the spectrum is giving quite indirect negative feedback. So here, negative feedback is provided softly, subtly, and diplomatically. Positive messages are often used to wrap negative ones. And we often see things like quantifying descriptors that are often used, like slightly unprofessional when criticizing. 
And criticism is also often only given in private. All right, so already here you can see the difference between these two different spectrums. And now you can see where some of the countries around the world fall on this spectrum. So again, a country like the Netherlands, where I'm based, is a country where giving direct negative feedback is very appreciated and accepted. And now on the other side, countries like Japan or Thailand or Indonesia um, are countries where we see much more indirect negative feedback. And then you can see where countries fall in between. Now again, let's have some advice for dealing with people from different cultures in evaluating. So if we're looking at strategies for working with people from direct negative feedback cultures, here try to provide clear and precise feedback on the areas that need improvement. Emphasize that feedback is about specific tasks, not a judgment of the individual and mix constructive criticism with the acknowledgement of positive aspects to maintain motivation. Additionally, provide practical guidance for improvement and demonstrating a commitment to support, okay? Now, on the other side of the spectrum, so when we have strategies for working with people from indirect negative feedback cultures, here, make sure to recognize subtle cues and indirect language as negative feedback might be conveyed more implicitly. Make sure to frame feedback diplomatically and tactfully, avoiding direct criticism to help to maintain harmony in the situation. Encourage individuals to elaborate on indirect feedback since indirect communicators may expect you to sort of read between the lines, okay? and make sure to invest time in building relationships and trust as individuals from these cultures may prefer a kind of relational context for feedback and discussions. Now let's move on to leading and uh, the way leaders or leading is seen in different cultural contexts. And here again, we have a spectrum from very egalitarian leadership to more hierarchical leadership. And on the egalitarian side, we have that the ideal distance between the boss and the subordinate is quite low. The best boss is a facilitator among equals. We see that organizational culture is quite flat and we see you know, not too many hierarchical lines when it comes to communication. Now, if we look at the hierarchical side of things, here the ideal distance between the boss and the subordinate is quite high, okay? The best boss is a strong director who leads from the front. Status is important in these cultures and organizational structures are multi-layered and fixed. And what's also important here is that communication generally follows a, a clear set of hierarchical lines. And here you can see where countries fall on these different spectrums. So on the very egalitarian side, you have countries like Denmark, the Netherlands, and Sweden. On the other extreme, you have countries like Japan, Korea, Nigeria, right? So think about, again, your own country and your old, own culture. Maybe some of those are represented here in this research. Maybe some aren't, and you can think about where you think your own country might lie on this spectrum. Now, of course, let's give some advice for working with people from these different contexts or working in these different contexts. So strategies for working with people from egalitarian leading cultures here are to encourage open communication and idea sharing, emphasize non-hierarchical organizational setups, involve the team in decisions and make sure to value diverse opinions, ensure fairness and acknowledging individual contributions. All right, so this is really important on the egalitarian side. Now, strategies for working with people from a more hierarchical, um, you know, leading cultures are to make sure to acknowledge and respect the established hierarchical structures, establish and follow clear reporting lines, clearly define roles, responsibilities, and authority levels, recognize achievements formally within the hierarchical framework. So again, very different here on these two different sides of the spectrum. Now we can also move on to how decisions are made. So again, on a continuum from consensual decision-making to very top-down decision-making. 
So on the consensual side, we see that decision-making involves consulting everyone. And decision-making in a process like this can be quite time-consuming. And once a decision is made, then implementation actually happens quite quickly. Um, decisions are um, fixed and not super flexible. And the decision-making uh, moment is really the pivotal moment because all of the ideas have been heard before. Now, in a more top-down side of things, here we see that decision-making responsibility lies with an individual, and this is very likely to be a boss. Decisions are often made quickly. Decisions can be also flexible and subject to revision because they can also be made quickly. Uh, but implementation can take a long time due to continual revision and maybe because everyone involved is not necessarily on board with the decisions that have been made. So here again, you can see on the consensual side, we see countries like Japan, Sweden, the Netherlands. On the opposite side, looking at more kind of top-down structures here, we see countries like Nigeria, China, India, and Russia. And then of course the countries that fall in between. So again, what is some advice for working in these different cultures? So strategies for working with people from consensual deciding countries are to collaborate and seek input from all team members, aim for consensus before finalizing decisions, maintain clear communication about the decision-making process, and make sure to emphasize teamwork and consider interpersonal dynamics. That is where you have a recipe for success. Now, on the other side, strategies for working with people from more top-down cultures, here you really need to acknowledge and respect the hierarchical authority, make sure to follow established channels for decisions and implementation, prioritize efficiency in decision execution and try to communicate decisions clearly and ensure understanding of the roles in the implementation process. So now we can move on to trusting. Now this is how trust is formed in the workplace. Is this more task-based or is this more relationship-based? So on the task-based side, we see that trust is built through business-related activities, um, work relationships are built and dropped easily, and they're based on practicality of the situation. Now, if you do work consistently, you are considered reliable, it's nice to work with the person, and they are considered trustworthy. On the other side, looking at relationship-based sides, trust is built through sharing meals and evening drinks and visits at the coffee machine. Work relationships are generally built up slowly over the long term. And here you, people think, okay, so I've seen you at a very deep level. I've shared personal time with you. I know others who trust you. And so therefore I will trust you. All right. So this is how trust is built on these two different spectrums. And all right, where do we see countries fall? So on the left side, on the more task-based side, we see again countries like the United States, Denmark, and the Netherlands, really on this left-hand side. And then we see on more on the relationship-based side, we see countries like Saudi Arabia, India, China, Nigeria, Brazil, Thailand, Turkey, a number of other countries. So again, where do you think your country fits in? So some advice for working in these different cultural contexts. So some strategies for working with people from task-based cultures. So here emphasize tangible results and meeting deadlines, set clear objectives and communicate um, requirements very precisely, demonstrate professional expertise and reliability, um, communicate straightforwardly um, progress and achievements. Now on the other side, strategies for working with people from re relationship-based trusting cultures. Here, you need to make sure that you invest time in personal relationships and showing genuine interests. Use a personal and context-aware communication style. Maintain regular and consistent communication for relationship nurturing. And recognize that trust often grows through strong interpersonal connections. 
So now we can go to how different cultures disagree with each other, all right? And here we have a spectrum from co being confrontational to avoiding confrontation. So on the left hand, on the confrontational side, we see that disagreement and debate are considered positive for a team or for an organization. Open confrontation is considered appropriate and will not ne negatively impact the relationship here, right? So it's really seen as an open environment where people can disagree with each other. Now on the other side, in cultures that avoid confrontation, we see that disagreement and debate are seen as negative um, for the team or the organization. And here open confrontation is considered inappropriate and will break the group harmony or negatively impact the relationships more generally. So now you can see where different countries uh, fall on this spectrum. So again, on the very left-hand side, on the more confrontational side, we see countries like Israel, France, Germany, Russia, the Netherlands on the left-hand side, where confrontation is considered important disagreements and being professional about this is considered important. On the right-hand side, countries that are more likely to avoid confrontation are Indonesia, Japan, Thailand, Ghana. So again, and then of course we have countries that fall in the middle. So again, you can think about where does your country fall on this spectrum. So some advice. So strategies for working with people from confrontational disagreeing cultures. So make sure to address disagreements openly and explicitly. View confrontation as a way to constructively solve problems. Emphasize that disagreement is about ideas and not personal attacks. Approach confrontation with a focus on finding solutions. And now strategies on the other hand, so strategies for working with people from cultures that avoid confrontation, make sure to navigate disagreements with subtlety and diplomacy, prioritize maintaining harmony and relationships, address disagreement in private rather than in public forums, and make sure to pay attention to nonverbal cues and subtle signals of disagreement. And now we can move to scheduling, all right? So this is a difference between, you know, more linear scheduling and more flexible time. So here we have the difference between linear time and flexible time. And this is maybe one of the things that you have seen come up in cultural differences even more. So on the left-hand side in cultures that look at linear time, here we see that project steps are approached in a sequential fashion. So completing one task before then beginning the next one. You really do one thing at a time and there are no interruptions. And the focus is on a deadline and sticking to the schedule. The emphasis here is on promptness and good organization over flexibility. Now on the other side, on the more flexible time side, here we see that project steps are approached in a more fluid manner. So changing tasks as opportunities arise and many things are dealt with at once and if interruptions are accepted. So the focus here is much more on adaptability, flexibility, and this is really valued um, in the organization and it's valued over, um, you know, very specific um, promptness and organization. So where do we see with where different countries fall on this spectrum? So on the more linear time, we have maybe a more very stereotypical countries in this regard. So we have Germany, we have Switzerland. And on the right hand side with much more flexible time, we have countries like Saudi Arabia, India, Nigeria, Kenya. But again, you can see how countries are in relation to each other. And again, relativity here is very important. So again, check out, think about where your country might fall on this continuum. Now, again, what is some advice for working in these different cultural contexts? So strategies for working with people from linear time cultures. So here emphasize punctuality and adherence to set schedules, follow detailed plans with clear timelines, make sure to prioritize efficiency 
and timeliness in the work process and treat time as a valuable resource to be managed effectively. So strategies for working with people from a flexible time culture then. So here you want to be adaptable and open to change in plans. Consider overall progress and allow flexibility in scheduling. Allow time for relationship building and informal interactions and be aware of cultural norms regarding perceptions of time. And now finally, our eighth area where we are going to look at these cultural differences in persuading. So here we have an idea of principles first versus application first. And then we even have another step, which is a more holistic approach. All right. So people or cultures that are principles first here, individuals have been trained to first develop a theory or complex concept before presenting a fact statement or opinion. The preference is to begin a message or report by building up a theoretical argument before moving to a conclusion. On the other side, on the application first side, individuals are trained to begin with a fact, a statement, or an opinion, and later to add concepts to back up or explain the conclusion as necessary. The preference is to begin with a message or a report with a, an executive summary, for example, or bullet points. Discussions are approached in a practical and very concrete manner. And now on the holistic side, here we see that the focus is on interdependencies and interconnectedness, and, and it is a bit more of a mix of these two things. So here again, you can see where countries fall on this spectrum. So countries that are more principles first are countries like Italy, France, Russia, and Spain. Countries that are more application first are countries like the US, Canada, Australia. And then countries that take a more kind of holistic approach are countries like Japan, Jordan, Kenya, Korea, Kuwait, and many others, all right? So of course, as usual, let's look at some advice um, when working in cultures that have different cultures of persuading. So first, if we look at strategies for principle first cultures, here we see a focus on presenting overarching principles first construct logical and structured arguments, provide in-depth explanations of theoretical foundations, and showcase expertise in the subject matter. Now, for people coming from cultures that are more application first, here you wanna begin with real world examples and applications, use tangible evidence and demonstrations, and then highlight the immediate benefits and the, re and the, the relevance of what's going on and make sure to frame the argument as a solution to a specific problem. Now, for people or cultures that are coming from a more holistic persuading side of things, make sure to provide a holistic context for the proposal. Emphasize relationships between different elements and use storytelling to uh, illustrate kind of the holistic impact. Make sure here also to highlight collaborative aspects and the cooperative nature of what you're doing. So there you have it, some of the eight different dimensions of intercultural communication. I hope you found this helpful. I hope you could also see yourself, see your own culture, or see the cultures that you work on, on these different continuums. And I hope this gave you some food for thought when working in different cultures and hopefully this will give you a smoother time with better communication. Of course, if you found this video helpful, please make sure to like it. If you haven't done so already, subscribe to the channel and hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of the videos that we upload on a regular basis on different migration topics. And I definitely hope to see you next time. Bye-bye.